Hello, Scouted Football Podcast fans. Welcome back to another instalment. Um, we have changed the social media profiles at Scouted, which can only mean one thing. The announcement of our Volume 9 cover star is upon us, and that will be with you very, very soon. Uh, not wanting to give too much away, I'd just like to give top marks to, to Kevin McGiven, who has agreed to illustrate our covers this year. Uh, and, and if the next three are anything like the first, then I, you, we, we're all in for a, for a treat with that one. Uh, but that's enough handbook chatter. Uh, you've come here for the Scouted Football Podcast and I'm not planning on disappointing. Um, I'm returning today with with the fantastic guest of honour, uh, Lee Scott, and, and we're going to have a little bit of a natter about South American players, which is sort of a little bit left field as most of our pods do seem to hinge on, on European football. So uh, we thought it would be a good idea to, to, to branch out a little bit further afield. Um, I'm sure he's delighted to be back on the pod discussing a brand new topic, um, some some brand new players from from far off destinations that uh, we can only dream of visiting uh, at the moment. But Bonnie Scotland will, will have to do for now, won't it, Lee? How how are things with you? I'm fine, thanks, Joe. How are you? Yeah, not bad, not bad. Good to good to get chatting again. Uh, I think last time was before before Christmas and New Year, so plenty to catch up on. But um, first off, um, you you you've signed off on on a new book and you've you've completed the uh, the Marcelo Bielsa Twelve Steps to the Premier League. Um, how how does that feel? It's great. It's great that the the book on Bielsa is out now. That was obviously a, a long a long long term project trying to get all of that finished, and then credit to the publishers and the team that they work with for getting all of that turned around so quickly and then on the shelves or the virtual shelves as it may be at the moment yeah it's just it's really nice to see people with it in their hands if you like and a lot of good feedback a lot of people being very positive about it so far which is is obviously great it's what you want when you you take the time to write something in that way and yeah i'm just really glad that it's out now i think i'm a bit of a glutton for punishment though because i've already signed <laughs> off on a new contract for the next one so my, my wife thinks that i'm crazy but time will tell well, I mean, all geniuses weren't, weren't appreciated in their time, so you know, you never know. It might be, it might be the, the start of something, something brilliant. But um, if, if if the first two books on Liverpool and Manchester City are anything to go by, then then this on Bielsa and, and, and Leeds will be uh, will be just as good, if not better. Um, but that's not the only thing that we have to, to catch up on. Of course, um, you you've taken on a new position of, of head of analysis at at Velez F, uh, CF, not FC. <laughs> um, What's that all about? I mean, it sounds like a really exciting role. Yeah, it's part of a an overarching project that we have um, as part of our consultancy department at Total Football Analysis. We started to work with Velez last year when a new ownership group came in. Um, part of that ownership group was a, a gentleman named Magnus Persson, who used to be the Estonian national team manager. Um, he got to the point within management where he didn't like the short termism of it all. He felt like there was no time to fully build a project in the the kind of vision that he wanted. So he'd say his next step would be a director of football level, which is what he is at, at Velez. So he took us on originally as consultants and uh, we worked on a consultancy basis and now we've been asked to make it a little bit more formal going into the well the end of this season when Velez are we're, we're challenging for promotion at the moment to Segunda B which would obviously be huge for the club considering we were expected to consolidate down towards probably the, the bottom half of the table this season um, so then obviously planning for next season is, is taking shape at the moment but there's kind of two strands to planning we're planning for life as a Segunda B side and as a Tercera side. So uh, a lot of split analysis and split scouting going on at the moment. It's, it's exciting times. Yeah, certainly. It sounds like a very avant-garde um, little uh, little setup you've got going on there. And I, I think it's always good that, you know, people in football directorship are always looking for fresh new ideas and, and looking for a different way of, of taking a, of, of having a real go at things. Uh, and so, so, I mean, that's the the the, the Velez move is, is you know has been celebrated across football Twitter. I'm I'm sure you've seen you know the amount of people who who sent you congratulatory messages. I'm, I'm sure, um, and and just you know thank you for for, for coming back on. Um, just by way of sort of catching up, you know, it's been it's been about a month and a bit now. Um, and and there's been so much football. And this, I mean, the the, the Champions League has returned uh, in the in the last few days. We've seen Erling Haaland not wanting to be outstaged uh, by Kylian Mbappe on on consecutive nights. You know what has been 
this is kind of a bit of a, a question from left field, but what has been sort of the best individual performance you've watched over the period, you know, since we last spoke, you know, any game, any league, any player, as, as rogue as you can find or, or as mainstream as you like, you know what, I'm putting you on the spot here, but you know, what is, what is the best that you've seen? I I think it depends what you define as best. I think that everybody obviously was so taken with Kylian Mbappe at the new camp with his the explosive way that he he took apart that Barcelona defensive unit. But I think that credit for that also has to go to Maurizio Pochettino, who obviously put a game plan in place that was so well thought out in terms of how they transitioned and they, how they blocked off the centre of the pitch and denied Messi the space that he would normally have and how that frustrated Barcelona. But you can't take away from the individual performance of, of Kylian Mbappe or, or of Erling Haaland last night. I haven't fully caught up on that one yet because we've got a little bit of an earlier start today and had a few things to take care of before recording. I'm going to go a little bit probably left field to an extent. I, I spent quite a lot of time earlier in the week watching the Barcelona versus Alaves match. Um, a bit of a strange one because it was so one-sided in terms of the performance. Barcelona won 5-1. Um, Alaves struggled to, to have any imprint on the game. But this was the first time I think that I've really seen R- Ricky Puig come alive in a Barcelona shirt in the first team setting for me. We've all known about the the potential um, and watching him in that game, the way that he received the ball in front of the midfield line for Alaves before passing it on and drawing them out slowly, creating space for other players with his one or two touch movement. I think that was the first time I've really seen the comparisons between him and Xavi, which really struck me and, and I felt was really interesting so I'd probably plump with that well although you're right there has been so much football I think my football watching in, in January maybe dipped a little bit because we were doing so much work as part of the consultancy in terms of recruitment work for clubs agents um, even players we were doing reports for players at the same time so that's kind of why we haven't had a chance to talk I think we, we've both been really busy over the last few weeks so I'm, I'm just kind of settling back into a football watching routine now yeah, it's been a hectic one. It's nice sometimes to just sit down and, and, and watch it, the, you know, the big game of the evening um, sort of without sort of a, a particular focus on it. So that's that's kind of what, I, what I've been deriving my pleasure from for the past few evenings um, with, with those games. And, and when you do catch up with Haaland's uh, performance against Sevilla, then, you know, you'll, you'll see the automatic robotic Haaland in, in, in all his glory, as, as we have seen so often. Um, but that, that's an interesting one. Um, Ricky Puig, I think, you know, he's a fantastic young player. Uh, has maybe been sort of, I don't want to say os- ostracised, it's a very, very strong word, but, you know, he was kind of cast aside a little bit by Ronald Koeman, I think, earlier in the yep. season. But, um, you know, with with the fact that they've 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 exercised the extension at Barcelona in, in Ricky Puig's contract, um, I think, you know, the, the next few years are definitely going to be, be very big for him uh, at, at, at Camp Nou um, because... I personally don't see Ronald Koeman lasting too long, given the current circumstances. Uh, I think it's fair to say. Uh, and if if he was sort of the the main figure who was holding Puig back from from you know being a, a first team regular, which he we know he's capable of being, um, then um, yeah, I think uh, a different manager may may come to appreciate his talents a little bit more. <laughs> Anyway, this week's episode is going to be on South America. Uh, and, and Liam, I'm, I'm sure that you'll have watched plenty of South American football uh, over the past few months, you know, with your consultancy work. You know, there is there is always a gem to be mined in, in the South American leagues. And I'm not just talking about uh, Brazil's Brasileira or, or Argentina's Primera Division. Uh, you know, there are, there are players everywhere in Ecuador, Colombia, Paraguay, Uruguay, you know, all, all the countries that perhaps don't get discussed as often when, when talking about South American football. Um, you know, it's been home to some of the, the greatest players ever, to, ever to grace the beautiful game. You know, Leonidas, Garincha, Pele, Socrates, Ronaldo, Kaká, you know, throughout the years, they've, they've been fantastic at World Cups. Um, you know, and, and then of course, you know, Maradona, Valdano, Ardiles, Kempes, uh, Batistuta, and of course, Lionel Messi from, from Argentina. Um, they're of course the big two. Uh, but on this episode, we are going to hear it for the, for the little guy as well. Uh, the smaller nations, as I've just discussed. Um, because they have equally produced their fair share of global stars uh, as well. Um, 
And there, there'll, there'll be a bit of both. You know, we'll, we'll draw on some Brazilian and Argentine talents as well. But um, I think one of the things that, that struck me, Lee, when, when we were doing sort of our, our background for this and we shared notes was that, um, you know, we, we didn't pick any of the same players. And sometimes that, that is the case in, in Europe because, you know, the hype surrounding a player in Europe can be so, you know, suffocating that it just, it's in, almost impossible to not get wrapped up in it. But with, with South America, you know, I, I feel like there, there, is, there are so many competitions for a start. So, so by default, there are so many players to discuss. And, you know, the, the fact that we didn't, we didn't uh, cross paths in that sense is, is a good sign, I think. I think so. I think that you're right. The, the depth of quality of talent in South America is still very much there. Um, there's so much different types of players and different styles of football within South America as, as a as a continent that there's so much for you to choose from depending on what kind of profile of player you want to go for. I think it is noteworthy that we've picked four players each and I don't think there's a defender amongst them. <laughs> I think that's just part of, of South American football. You, you're naturally drawn to the the kind of attacking output because games there can be so open. I mean, the, the Copa Libertadores is, is one of my very favourite tournaments. I, I watch as much of it as I can and that is from an enjoyment standpoint more possibly than a, than a scouting or consulting standpoint because the games can be so open and so interesting. Um more from an individual player point of view sometimes than from a tactical point of view. Um, I think that the, the early stages of the Libertadores especially are fantastic when you get some of the, the smaller, lesser-known teams that are playing some of the, the bigger teams in South America and you, you see some, some crazy, crazy sights along with some exciting, exhilarating football. I think that part of what makes South America so interesting from a, a young player development and from a, a scouting point of view is that there's so much disparity in terms of social economic status in different countries, different regions of these countries, different cities where these players are growing up. Some of them are growing up in middle class backgrounds more often now. You're seeing that in Argentina, especially. You're seeing players breaking through who perhaps have come from wealthier backgrounds, but there are still the other side of that coin. There's still the players like the Maradonas who who grow up in the barrios, who, who grow up playing cage football, street football, and South American players so often, especially in an attacking sense, have that that bit of the devil around them. The type of thing you saw from Carlos Tevez, from uh, Sergio Aguero has it. There are numerous different examples throughout the continent of, of players who've came to Europe and achieved fame and glory and, and football and success who who have that edge. I think, of course, Luis Suarez is, is maybe the poster boy for that at the moment, but we all know about his his combative edge that he has and he's always shown it throughout his career and I think sometimes European teams covet that from South American players because the, in Europe in Europe, players tend to develop through youth academies where everything's kind of given to them and laid out, they play on nice green pitches, they, they have the very best equipment they have the best modes of transport to get to games, at least at the higher levels and I think there's something to be said for taking in a young player who hasn't had that and has that desire and hunger to to kind of prove himself and prove everybody wrong. I think that's always been an interesting aspect of recruitment from South America. Yeah, I think there definitely has to be a disparity because, you know, there's, growing up in those different socioeconomic backgrounds, it, it's fundamentally going to produce a different person. It always does, never mind a different football player, which is, you know, uh, one of the, the the greatest modes of outward expression, you know, that, that a young talented player can 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 have. That that may often be the only form of outward expression that 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 player has, that person has. Um, so naturally, it is going to he's going to throw up lots of different characters on the pitch as well as off it. So, I mean, just just before we get into sort of the individuals, I mean, those uh, looking through uh, Europe's major leagues, and you know, you look at see how many South Americans there are in in Europe, and you know, I think before the before the transfer window uh, in January, there were twenty five Brazilians in the Premier League, which was the fourth most common nationality, um, which surprised me somewhat. I mean, I knew there were a fair share, but twenty five kind of caught me by surprise. That's just over one per team, which. I think it's quite quite an quite an outlier by comparison. There's only ten Brazilians in the Bundesliga, um, a similar amount in La Liga, twenty one, uh, but then thirty seven Brazilian players in Serie A, which yep. again caught me by surprise. Um, Serie A, though, I, I, I'm sort of more aware that there are more South American players, but to the extent of twenty eight Argentinians and, and twelve Uruguayans <laughs> as well, I was quite taken aback by the fact that 
this has just been something which I was loosely aware of, but not to the same extent. Um, you know, it was it was something which which kind of caught me by surprise. And then you kind of go into you you delve a little bit deeper and you look at certain clubs and their recruitment. So for say Ajax, for example, you know they they've they've scouted South America and they've scouted it really well in recent times. You know, you, all you need to look at is like David Neres and Anthony coming from the Sao Paulo route, um, Lisandro Martinez from Defensa y Justicia in Argentina, uh, Nico Tagliafico from Independiente. Uh, and of course, De Vincent Sanchez, before he, he moved on to Spurs, was at Ajax as well, but he signed from Atletico Nacional in, in Colombia. So, you know, they've got quite a, a breadth there that, 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 that they've covered. Um, I suppose that that's probably going to get us on to, to what we're going to discuss. I mean, where would you like to start, Lee, with, with, the, um, with, with the individuals? W- w- which country are you going to go for first? Oh, I'll, I'll choose mine first then. Um, I'll go with the youngest player on my list, um, 17 year old striker who who is still playing in Colombia but prior to us recording this podcast and when we started discussing this podcast it was uh, a good few weeks ago now obviously with everything else getting in the way he actually uh, was announced as having signed for Chicago Fire in the MLS and he'll join them in 2022. Uh, I'm talking about the 17 year old Envigado striker Jean Duran um really interesting profile of player when, when you look at it i mean again looking through the rest of players on our list we, we've got a lot of what you would call diminutive players are shorter perhaps a little bit stockier they, they've got that low center of gravity that so many great south american players seem to have had the maradonas the messies the pablo Aymars, all these different players had that that kind of same or similar physique duran isn't the same he stands 185 centimeters tall he's powerful and for a player who's only 17, it, it's notable when you watch him on the pitch, when you watch him play, because he's very much a number nine. He's a player who's going to play there for the next decade and a half, at least, for, throughout his career. You can't see him being the kind of player, often when young attacking players come through, you see clubs like to use them in the wide areas in the first couple of instances, just to allow them to kind of acclimatise to first team football more than anything else. But Duran has that that frame and that build that, that doesn't lend itself to playing out in wide positions. He's, he's quite powerful and stocky and likes to use his frame with players. The, what's interesting is that there's quite a lot of scope, I think, for him to to add a little bit of muscle as he gets older. He's, he's got quite a broad-shouldered physique, and you can see him as he, he starts to develop and starts to grow and starts to get to the point where he's working in weight rooms in more professional environments, if you like. There is an opportunity there for him to, to really start to build muscle onto his frame, but... Of course, you have to be careful with that. We, we saw what happened with Romelu Lukaku when he was at Manchester United when he perhaps built a lot of bit too much muscle on his frame and then you lose some of your movement profile and agility. Um, what Duran gives you at the moment, he, he's single-minded. He, he presses really well out of possession. He's, he's quick to close down opposition defenders as they're trying to build up. And whenever a mistake's made, he, he's so single-minded in his pursuit when he gets the ball. He just likes to head towards goal and try and try and cause problems for the opposition defence, if you like. Um, a left-footed striker with quite a lot of power. He's good in the air. He, he moves well. But it'll be really interesting to see how he takes and adapts to, to life in the MLS because not only has he, he signed for a club in the MLS in Chicago Fire, but he's moving to a city in Chicago where the the environment is going to be very, very different to what he's had growing up in Colombia. Obviously, Chicago gets extremely cold. For those that don't know, they, they have a great deal of snowfall things like this will take an adjustment for him and that's when you kind of you see the hunger in a player come out so it'll certainly be interesting to see how he he handles the the transition to the MLS into life in a different country. Lee it's interesting that you you've gone with John Duran for your first one um because with with the the, the player that I this uh, first on my list who's perhaps a little bit more mainstream in, in South American circles than John Duran is is Brenner from from Sao Paulo because uh, he he also made a move over the last few weeks uh, to FC Cincinnati in MLS, um, which is a move which I, I can understand. I can understand why he may have been advised to make that move. You know, a young young striker who's who's got a very good goals record in Brasileiro. Um, you know, to to be going to to MLS, which is you know fast becoming a, a real route for for these younger 
uh, South American players uh, to, to to take that first step outside of the continent. Um, I can see why he's made this move because you know there'll be there'll be finances involved, but from a competitive perspective, uh, I, I struggle uh, because you know he's he, Cincinnati were not a great team in MLS last season. And with Brenner, he's very much a, a poacher in terms of he's always the one who's finishing the move. You know, you're not going to get a great deal from him in in deeper spaces. You know, he he, he averaged I think it was three shots inside the 18 yard box per 90. You know, he's he's a player who thrives on 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 when that ball gets into those into those spaces. And I think with Cincinnati, um, they were you know obviously being a very very new franchise, they really weren't. Uh, they, they didn't seem all that joined up and this seems as though a, a move which is you know we have the we have the financial clout to be able to bring this player in but we may not have the structure in place to actually get the best out of him um so I, it'll be interesting to see how he adapts because because again as 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 you say with John Duran you know it's going to be a big a big change um you know Cincinnati I'm not an expert on on uh, U.S. meteorology, but I, I'm fairly sure that it'll probably get quite cold there as yeah. well, given the location. Um, but f- for me, Lee, I don't know what your stance is on on sort of the the wider moves of, of South American youngsters going to MLS. Um, but w- w- what are your thoughts on on sort of Brenner's move? And, and to be fair, on on John Duran's move, I think it's it's really interesting. It's it's symptomatic of what is being seen in a wider sense is the rise of MLS. Uh, I think that MLS is now getting to the point where it can be seen as a genuine alternative for players of this profile to the move to Europe, to maybe second-tier European leagues that we would have seen before. I mean, if you go back 10 years, if Brenner had, had broken through um, in Brazilian football at Sao Paulo 10 years ago, he would have been nailed on for a move to FC Porto or, or, or Benfica. Um, it would have been that kind of profile of club in European football, even Ajax, I, I guess, to, to use your example from earlier on. It would have been that kind of level and that kind of profile that Brenner would be going to. I think you're absolutely right. I think that Brenner in particular is is a player who, who thrives on on chances in the penalty area and that can be something that's difficult to come by for clubs like Cincinnati who are still trying to build an identity in terms of the way that they they play in the MLS. For those that don't watch a lot of MLS it's a really intriguing league in itself because there's such a a wide variety of team styles and across the different conferences and even within the same conferences sometimes you have the likes of New York City who who play a positional style you have New York Red Bulls who play kind of more transitional in terms of the way that they like to move the ball forward you have the two LA teams who are extremely good to watch and Atalanta United all of these sides are are really different but really interesting at the same time I think the saving grace for Brenner at Cincinnati for me is that he's quite good at making his own chances. Um, there, there's one in particular. If you want, if anyone wants to go back and have a look at some some highlights of Brenner, Google his goal against Flamengo. Um, you'll get it on YouTube where Flamengo are looking to build up from the back as they 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 tend to do. The ball gets passed back to the goalkeeper, but before the goalkeeper can even get out of his feet, and he's standing more or less in his own line. Brenner's not only closed him down but picked his pocket and just rolled the ball into the goal. I think. He's really good at pressing in that way and cutting off passing lanes and looking to win the ball back quickly for his team. Um, what's going to be interesting, and it's players like Brenner, like Jean Duran, there are other examples within MLS as well of players from South America who are already there. What's going to be interesting is where their next step beyond MLS is. Is MLS going to be it for some of them? Will they stay out their career moving around franchises? And don't get me wrong, the, the financial rewards for players from South America doing that are, are noteworthy that they'll make very good careers or very good livings out of being South American players within the MLS. But will the alternative is, will they move to Europe? Because sometimes it can be difficult. I mean, we, we, we've all seen it within recruitment terms that the clubs in the Premier League in particular can be a little bit snobby about where they pick up players from. They, they'll look for a player to make a move to another top five league first before deciding they'll be good enough for the Premier League, if you like. It's a little bit short-sighted in the way that they, they approach things. You saw it with 
like to Sadio Mane. Sadio Mane wasn't picked up from RB Salzburg, despite the fact that he he was being linked and tracked by clubs like Liverpool, Arsenal, Manchester United. They're all aware of Sadio Mane. Bayern Munich were the same, but he had to go to a Southampton before the bigger clubs would say, OK, he is good enough. So what next for Brenner? Will, will Brenner stay there? Will he eventually make a move to Portugal or to Holland or another bridge league, if you like, or maybe to French Ligue 1, which is traditionally seen as the weakest of the top five leagues will that be his bridge into European football or will he need one I think that we're seeing a real shift in the dynamic in terms of football recruitment and and pathways that players will take away from from those tiers in Europe where the money might not be immediately attractive but the benefits after the first move may be more attractive into players moving to MLS instead. So it's definitely a trend. It's definitely something to keep an eye on. And MLS teams are doing very well in terms of tapping the talent within South America. Yeah, I mean, just on that point of, you know, moving from MLS to, to Europe, we saw Mark McKenzie get a move to, to Genk in, in, in Belgium, which again, isn't, you know, a hugely high profile league. But at the same time, it's it's a well-run club. You've got a, a, quite a clear identity there. You know, they, they do tend to recruit quite well and they recruit from all over. I'm thinking sort of, John Lukumi and, and and Carlos Cuestas that they would signed from from the Americas uh, before that. Um, you know, with with Brenner, you know, I, I I agree. You know, he does create a lot of chances for himself. You know, if you wanted to 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 describe him in reductive terms, he'd be a pure striker. You know, always pops up in that that goal scoring space, um, which again is right place, right time. But at the same time, is absolutely not that. It's it's you know having that innate ability to find areas you know pull like to to pull back when when maybe balls are going to get cut back and you know find that that area where everybody swarms towards the ball uh, and he's the one you know appreciating where the space is where the ball might drop I think he may find more of that in MLS I think um, you know it's it, it's probably more of a sidestep than, than anything um, b- because you know if, if he ends up you know being a 10-15 goal se- uh, striker in MLS you know I think you you could safely say that with his age, with his physical profile, with his his record in Brazil as well in tow, then you 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 probably have to say that plenty of European clubs would be looking at him. It's obviously a risk because if he crashes and burns, and you know it's 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 possible in a team which is currently being managed by Yap Stam and um and has you know it doesn't exactly have the best record, doesn't perhaps isn't as joined up or has the best structure yet. Um, you know it's it's a risk, but financially he will be well endowed shall we say um from from this move uh because you know it's it's it, it is it is proving to be a, a, a lucrative as well as you know a, a springboard kind of platform um for for these young south american players as you say you know you look at them even miguel almiron's from from years gone by at, at atlanta united uh, ezekiel barco um uh, eduard atuesta at lafc you know these all these south american players are um are finding are finding a home, uh, and I think it, it it will continue to be sort of that that kind of division. Moving on, just quickly, uh, Lee, your second player um, in my list here. I'm wondering if it'll be the one that you've gone down in in, in consecutive order. Who knows? I tend to jump around quite a lot when I do these things with you. Um, <laughs> I, I'm going to go for Carlos Palacios. Yes, that's the one. I see the one. Okay, um, twenty year old Chilean. Um, He's already made his international debut for Chile, full international debut in, in November of last year, which um, shows a little bit of how highly he's thought of. What's interesting about about Palacios is that he doesn't play for one of the traditional powerhouses in Chilean football, and and this is this is kind of something that you see more in South America, I think, than in Europe. You, you can see talented players popping up at teams across the spectrum. So he's not he's not somebody who you would you would naturally think of at a Colo Colo or a Universidad de Chile. He actually plays for Union Española, um, who have been doing quite well in recent years, but he is by far, I think, the the best young talent they they've developed in recent times. Um at the moment he is one who when I just spoke about about players quite often is that they break through first team level, they're, they're played out in wide areas and that's something that we have seen from Palacios. Um, he has played, he's, he's right footed but he's played on the right or he's played on the left or occasionally we will see him in what I think will become his, his preferred position which is his number eight. He's got a really interesting 
ability when you watch him play. He he reminds me a lot of, in his movement profiles. He, he makes similar movements in similar pockets to receive the ball that we saw from David Silva, who when he was at his pomp at Manchester City, um, kind of takes up the same kind of areas in the half space. And when he receives the ball with his back to goal, he's really fluid with his movements, despite being quite tall he's 180 centimeters he's not a small player by any any stretch of the imagination so he is easy to pick out in the field he, he's not a player who uses his smaller frame if you like to roll a defender and move past him instead he's got this really nice balance to him when he receives the ball he'll move his hips and just turn left or right comfortable going either way when defenders are at his back um what i really like about him is that he's got this ability that you see occasionally in players and not every creative player has this and when you see it it really stands out when he receives the ball in the final third with space he's got a really really nice touch not everything looks clean when he make, looks to make through balls or flick the ball through for for his teammates or just interlink with them but what he does is he shapes his foot really nicely and it's something that you see from players who've obviously grown up playing on on pitches that are not substandard but not of the standard that you would see in in a Premier League academy for example you know that the pitches have been rocky or bumpy or had puddles on them or he's been playing on on tar or on different clay surfaces because he has an ability to shape his foot when he makes contact with the ball just to put spin on it and it's a way of finding solutions players who who grew up playing on those those pitches which are more difficult to play on they find solutions to the way the ball bounces and you see that with the way that he plays through balls sometimes he he puts an an unusual spin on the ball that just kind of takes it away from a defender and finds the path of his teammate and he 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 displays that really well something that makes him so interesting for me i think that we're likely to see him move to europe um sooner rather than later but i think he's a player who for a, a possession oriented team he would be really interesting for example if he was to go into PSV Eindhoven at the moment under Roger Schmidt I think that Schmidt would really like his his ability in those half spaces in the final third and it's kind of an interesting to see exactly what where he decides to go now but he is a lovely player to watch yeah from the from the small clips that i was able to to watch yesterday what i could glean from that was that he is very good at receiving on the turn you know he's very adept he's not sort of square he'll be you know very open to those 180 degree movements when he receives the ball with his back to go um and i think I mean that obviously for, for for obvious reasons that that lends well to to making a move to Europe. But I think a lot of the time people may look at South America and think, well, what would be a comparative league that that you know that, that he's currently playing in here? Because you know I think people know that the best leagues are probably Argentina and Brazil. But beyond that, you know how far how severe is the drop off? You know yeah. how competitive it, it is. Uh, effectively, how competitive are Chilean teams going to be in the Copa, de Li- Copa Libertadores in Sudamericana? You know, um, uh, essentially, you know, where could you see him? Sort of hypothetically, would it be a PSV who who would move uh, for for a player of his stature? Um, you know, coming from from Chile. Because you know you with these types of players, I think sometimes you might see them move first to Argentina uh, or, or, or first to Brazil um, before then moving to to, um, to Europe. In the same way that players who perhaps uh, you know come through in Scandinavia in Europe, who then go to a Belgium or a Holland or a Denmark uh, or, or an Austria or, or a Netherlands, and then go to to one of Europe's top five leagues. What what is the what is the likely pathway going to be and, and so what comparative level would you put Chile's you know top division in? I think you, you've hit the biggest question in recruitment directly on the head there. It's a lot of what I, I spend time thinking about for total football analysis and working on it are different models that allow us to to take a player's output and to translate it, if you like, based on the current level and kind of show where that level sits when you look at other markets. So it's something that can be quite tricky to do. I spent quite a lot of time last year trying to build a similar model, similar World Super League model to to the kind of thing that Brentford are known to use um, 
I I built an algorithm and a model that that I think worked quite well, but it can be quite time consuming to for the upkeep for that. So it's something that I haven't revisited and plugged the data back in recently to see how it all looks. Um, also, as part of our, our consultancy, we, we work with a company called Analytics FC, who are quite well known uh, in terms of their, their recruitment and, and data scouting and things like that. And a lot of clubs throughout Europe use them and they've got their own tiers, if you like. So within their transfer lab platform, they, they give users the tiers that they use and how they split up leagues into different tiers to show this league in this tier is below this league in this tier and it's just intended they allow you to to automatically if you like translate a player's metrics and data by clicking on a different tier to show how their data would likely look if they were to move to a higher tier so it can be quite complicated but quite often football transfers are complicated I think Chilean football at the moment is in a period of downturn from where it was, what, 10, 15 years ago when Chilean football was very much in the ascendancy, when Marcelo Bielsa was at Ch- uh, was the Chilean national team manager, Jorge Sampaoli was the, the Universidad de Chile coach, and the football that they were playing in Chile was sensational, for, for want of a better word. Um, the quality isn't where it was, but that's not to say there's a, a real drop-off. I think within South America, you, you have potentially Argentinian and, and Brazilian leagues are the top tier, if you like. But then Chile comes below that, along with, I think, Colombia and Uruguay. And then perhaps below that, you're looking at, at Paraguay or the Ecuadorian league as well. Some Ecuadorian teams like Independiente de la Valle, they, they can be in a higher tier because they play such interest in football. So there's different ways to look at it. I think that you're right. There, there have been times gone by where Chilean players would automatically make the transfer to Argentina. It's quite an easy one in terms of cultural assimilation. There's a lot of a lot of similarities between Chilean culture and Argentine culture. The language is the same, so players would make that move quite easily. I think that we're likely to see Palacios make a move to Europe purely because his skill set lends itself so well to European football. Um, and I do think it will be a Holland or a Belgium, that kind of level that you're looking at, that he'll go in at. But you could also make the argument that Spanish La Liga sides towards the bottom half should be looking at a player like Palacios because his upside in, in terms of the cost profile that you're going to be paying in terms of transfer fee and wages, you have a real opportunity to get in at the ground floor to make a profit going forward. I suppose the, the the one who immediately comes to mind in that sense is Darwin Nunez, um, who's obviously at Benfica now, but yeah. came to Europe uh, with Almeria, who was in uh, the Segunda no. División in, in in Spain. So obviously their their, their second division. Um, you know the the upside that uh, you know Almeria have had there is is fantastic. You know they brought they brought him in. Clearly they they'd scouted him well. They knew that he physically would would adapt well to to Europe. And you know he scored a, a hat full of goals and and has since gone on to get I think it's eighteen goal involvements in his first thirty games in, with Benfica. Um, you know not too many goals in Liga Nosh, but he's 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 got a lot of assists and I very much like his movement um, and and especially how well he's done in in the Europa League. So I think yeah, there's definitely upside there for a player like Carlos Palacios um, for those bottom half La Liga sides because it's a relatively inexpensive deal. It's a move which, as you say, with going to Argentina. You know, coming to Spain, it would bring greater cultural uh, and social assimilation, but to to the same extent, it wouldn't be as much of a change as going to a Netherlands or a Belgium. So, I think it's one that certainly smart clubs should be looking at in 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 you know the bottom half of La Liga, you know, ones who perhaps don't have a huge budget, but you know could could do with a player who is again very robust, but also has that creative ability, you know, that that quality to um to 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 receive on the half turn and 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 change the shape of an attack and, and a transition. Um, my my second player uh, that that I've, I've gone for is 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 actually from Argentina, and he's very much like a like a typical Argentine player. The ones that that draw your attention. He's five foot seven inches tall. Um, his shot locations are very bad, uh, but he <laughs> is a, but he's a fantastic dribbler, and he's a great player to watch because, as you were saying about you know earlier, Lee, about the players which have the devil about them. You know, Agusti Nozzi uh, at Banfield, he is. is he he is you know very much a uh, like a Tasmanian devil I think um, you know he's very quick he's very cheeky it's it, it's hard to stop him 
Um, it, 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 you know, if you kick him, he'll just get up and he'll continue doing it. Um, and I think the reason that, that I've picked him over all the other players who are very similar in style is that he's he's an Argentine and Italian dual national, yeah. which means that for a potential move to Europe, you know, that could be made a lot easier if he has an Italian passport or, or applies for one. So, I. I Again, he he's he's one who I think could quite easily play out his entire career uh, in South America. Um, Banfield are not exactly a great team in, in Argentina's top flight. They're they're a pretty defensive team. Uh, they're, they're they're pretty passive, like lower mid table, um, not very expansive, tight at the back, uh, and and you know they're lacking going forwards. You know they don't really have a, 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 a fantastic attacking sort of setup. It it kind of relies on individuality, which is where Ursi comes in. Um, and I think just from watching him, you know, if he was playing in a more expansive setup, one which was counter-attack orientated, but at the same time, it had midfield runners, it, it, you know, there was pl- plenty of support where he isn't going down blind alleys, getting fouled a lot and having to move the ball quickly by himself, then I think he could really thrive. But of course, you know, there's it, it's, it's pointless trying to, to work out the, the various contract and transfer situations with, with South American players sometimes because there are just so many parties involved. Um, the the one thing that always stuck out to me was that, you know, just watching through through, through Erzy's clips is that he it's 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 like he enjoys being hemmed into tight spaces because he knows he has the ability to get out. You know, he he has that that wriggle ability, like he's like he's covered in butter. You know, he can just get out between two defenders who've who've tried to to box him in, and I think that's always something which. You know, when when supporters return, is is always going to be one that gets you know fans on off their seats and maybe gets the the shouts and the chants. You know, the, the oh um, that that you often get uh, when when players do do little pieces of trickery. Um, I don't know if you've seen anything of him or, or anything of Banfield, um, but he is very much the only reason to watch them. I, I think from from sort of my my very limited viewing. Yeah, he definitely is. Um, just as a, a direct comparison, I think that Erzi is essentially Lorenzo Insigne at Napoli. Um, very good point. That's, I, I hadn't made that assumption, but yeah, that is very good. He he has the same the same profile, the same characteristics, the same not nastiness. He, he's got the bit of the bastard about him, for want of a better word, and and that could be something that that's very very evident when you watch him play any level. I think that if you took the fact that Napoli are now quite a successful team out of the equation if Napoli were mid-table, you would essentially see Insigne making the same choices that Urzi makes when he's playing for Banfield because you're right, they're not great. But I think that if he moves to a club with a more attacking profile, I think they'll get more out of him. What what you do have to watch is that he is so fiery. He um, He's the kind of player who will argue with officials, he'll argue with teammates, he'll argue with himself, he'll argue with people in the crowd. He, he's got that, just that fire within him, which is like we've already talked about. It, it's no bad thing if a player can learn how to control that and harness that kind of temper. Then, then they, can be, they can be great. I think it, you're right, he, he's so good in tight situations, not just because of his size when he's quite small and can wriggle past players, but he likes contact from defenders. He almost, you see him, he has that, that pause when he receives the ball with the bat to go. He pauses and he waits for the defender to make contact and then he uses that contact just to move away and pass the defender. He's definitely somebody who's interesting. I would like somebody to just explain the concept of XG and, and <laughs> to him a little bit because he, he will literally shoot from anywhere. You'll see him get the ball in crossing situations and he tries to ping it at the far corner instead of taking the, the perhaps better option. But that's something that can be coached into a player. And to be perfectly honest, I remember Lorenzo Insigne as a young player and that was something, the same kind of criticism that was levelled at him and still can be sometimes. Insigne likes a, a shot from an angle too. Um, definitely an interesting player, one, uh, one that I hadn't actually considered for my list, but somebody who I have got on short list somewhere. Um, so we have watched him. You, you've kind of just tapped into something there in my brain with, with that XG comment, but with with South American teams, you know how you mentioned how that you know te- games are often a lot more end to end, you know, very transitional, and um, perhaps maybe don't have the same sort of structure, which uh, as as the you know the, the comparators in in Europe, you know, adds to the entertainment factor considerably. But what sort of bearing does that have on on the the weighting of of XG in South American games? You know, if you if you look at a a player who's got 
individually who's got huge, hugely inflated XG numbers because he plays in a South American competition. Is that something which you'd perhaps put less emphasis on if you were doing it in a scouting and consultancy role? Um, because you know that uh, for what for what for whatever reason, you know, the team that he plays for are very uh, you know, very gung ho. You know, they're they're going to concede a lot of chances, but they're also going to create a lot. Is there something where you'd have to perhaps add in a little mental caveat that you know his, his XG may be fantastic, but that's as a as a byproduct of the division that he's playing in. Yeah, and I think that that's something that you always have to be aware of within South American footballers when you're scouting forwards in particular that that goals per ninety, XG per ninety, shots per ninety. I mean, you, you talked about the fact that Brenner had so many shots within the penalty area alone, and that there are strikers that are very very good in European football that don't manage three shots per ninety in general, never mind within the penalty area. So you have to be aware of the level when you're scouting players like this, but you also sometimes it's just as simple as keeping notes within your report on the player to say that um, due to the transitional nature of the game it's difficult to judge their movement but when they did get a chance perhaps you're looking at the technique when they strike a ball and um, their body shape the way they open up their body how the kind of positions that they're getting into before they do shoot and those are all things that can feed into it so it's just I think when you're you're scouting in such a wide range and it can be so difficult i i always equate it to when you think about the the city group at the moment with their expansion they've got so many different clubs within that sphere and recruitment consultants and scouts within the city group are expected to be scouting for all levels at all times so you might be watching a game one day and see a player who you like that you know won't fit Manchester City, but you think to yourself, well, he would be quite good at Girona, or he would be good in Belgium at Lommel, or he would be good in New York City. So having all these different pictures in your head as a scout, because you get used to what I call levels. So I've done um, recruitment projects in the last 12 months for clubs in the Champions League. We've done them for clubs in the lower leagues of England. We've done them for Belgian sides in the first and second tier. All these different places and now in Spain and Tercera. So many different levels of football. It can be difficult to keep your eye in and to understand what you're looking for in terms of whether a player can fit that level. And I think that's where you have to have the ability to combine data and video and more holistic information for example social media and all these different pieces that pulled together into a final report I, I think that's where you kind of have to make sure as a scout or somebody who's doing recruitment and, and this this counts for for people on twitter who are writing reports who who want to become scouts if, if you want to have a blog or just do threads on twitter just Always think to yourself, what levels is this playing at now? What level could this player play at? And why do I think he can play at that level? And it's important for scouts to have an opinion, but also to be realistic within their opinion. And I think when you're looking at, at South American leagues, you are talking about team uh, games where XG may be weighted slightly differently than it would be in Europe because it can be so open or you can have a, a Boca Juniors playing against a team who come from a provincial town within Argentina who don't have a fraction of the budget and the games can be skewed that way. So you do have to take that into account. But I think that's why it's important that when you're scouting players, especially in South America, that you do so over multiple matches. So if we have a specific target within South America, I think as opposed to what would be normal practice might be you would watch five games. You would watch them play at home, you'd watch them play away, you'd watch them play a couple of games against teams at the top of the table and maybe one against a team at the lower end of the table. And you're just trying to build a full picture on what that looks like. I think for players in South America, you might up that to eight to ten games and then you're trying to build a full picture across the spectrum that way. Because there are so many variables that are going to be at play that mean that you, if you watched sort of the, the five games, the home away, as you just mentioned there, you perhaps wouldn't get the full picture or, yeah. or as, as close to a full picture. Yeah, no, I understand where you're coming from there. I think that's that's a fair assumption to make. And, you know, that when we're saying all this, you know, it's not a slant towards South American football. As yeah. we've said, it yeah. is absolutely one of the most entertaining, um, you know, regions of world football. And that's, you know, that at the end of the day, we can talk about scouting and consultancy all day, but sometimes you just want to sit down and watch an entertaining game that's why <laughs> that's why from you know the Copa Libertadores whenever it's on TV over here it's always a great watch because it's such a refreshing you know it's such it's such refreshing viewing um yeah. 
And, and, and you know, you do end up stumbling across players who you may see pop up at Udinese or, or Cagliari or Bologna or, yeah. you know, God knows where in, in a few years' time. So it's always, it's, it's always interesting from, from multiple angles. Uh, my third player is Alan Velasco, um, another Argentine player, another diminutive Argentine player who plays in the wide areas. Um, currently playing for Independiente in the top tier of Argentine football. Um, he is 18 years old. Um, really, really interested. I think he, he's currently capped under 17 level by Argentina, but hasn't made the breakthrough yet at the, the higher age groups, but I fully expect him to. Um, he's somebody who, in contrast a little bit to Udzi, who was your last pick, he's somebody who is playing for a more expansive and attacking side, but Velasco is very much put himself in the frame already 18 as one of their key players he's really really good um carrying the ball it's quite often you'll see him within games he looks to engage two or three opposition players at once and he has this lovely ability it never looks like to the naked eye like he's moving that quickly but he seems to glide past players left or right he's got that that lovely ability that balance that you want with a player who who is a dribbler. Um, you want them to be able to engage and beat players to the left or the right. Sometimes you'll you'll see players who are very, very good. Take um take Adama Traore, for example, at Wolves. Always a fantastic dribbler, but you know which way he's going to go whenever he gets the ball. He very rarely cuts back inside towards the left foot unless he's, he's going inside for a shot. When he's engaging in deeper positions, he'll always try and go on his stronger right foot. Velasco has got that ability to use both sides, both feet. He moves his feet really quickly. Um, good control of the ball, good ball manipulation, and he's also a bit of a finisher. Um, he, he scored a couple of cracking goals just just recently against Boca Juniors. One was a goalkeeper mistake from range, but but the other was a fantastic strike. Um, somebody who I think has all the tools to make a real genuine impact at a, a quality level. It's interesting that you mention uh, another Argentinian player uh, because my final pick was was between two and it, it was going to be uh, Thomas Bermonte, uh, who's at Lanus, who's, who's very much a, a, a very destructive but um, yeah. goal-scoring defensive midfielder um, who was very, very interesting to me. But in fact, you know what? I am going to go with Thomas Belmonte because I think we've discussed wingers quite a bit today and it was going to be Jaminton Campas at Deportes Tolima. Um, and I was thinking, you know, we'll go with we'll go with a Colombian um, player. But, you know, I think Belmonte d- definitely has the, the, the intrigue about him because he's a little bit different. You know, we've discussed Carlos Palacios and how he, his future may be through the middle. But, you know, to Belmonte has, has f- first of all, a fantastic name, but also has very, very big disruptive energy. You know, he's, he was averaging something around three tackles per 90 in, in the Argentine Superliga, 2.1 interceptions. You know, he's a former um, Argentine under-23 international. You know, he's, he's a very decorated player in terms of he's played a lot of football. Um, this season, he's been used from the bench a little bit more. I don't know whether that's down to club politics, uh, at drop in form or that sort of thing. But, you know, 20, 2019 was kind of the last time that he played properly, as in like regularly. Um, with 2020, as as with everybody, it was being very disrupted by, you know, the seasons ending early and, and whatnot and, and not getting full pre-seasons. But he does score a, an awful lot for a player who is who's quite disruptive by nature and and defensive focus primarily you know he he can play as an eight uh, as well as a six which is is the versatility that i think european clubs would like um you know he i wouldn't say he's he's liable to create an awful lot and that's why i wouldn't put him at, at sort of a an elite level um because you know he he has that destructive side but you know he's he's going to rely on on other people creating the chances for him um but i think it, it, I, like like you said with Carlos Palacios, I think there is scope to say that you know the teams in Europe could certainly look at, at Lanos and think, well, Belmonte is the standout in this team. You know he, he's he's doing a bit of everything really. Uh, you know he's doing very well in his defensive work, but I think it's in the Sudamericana. You know he scored once every other game from 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 the number six number eight position. So it's it's an interesting profile. It doesn't really fit a certain mould. You know, he's not purely a Wilfred Ndidi type defensive midfielder. Uh, he's not he's not a number eight who who presses really hard and that's all he does. But maybe creates a lot. Um, he's he, he's kind of there's a little bit missing in between. Um, you know, he's very good in the penalty area, but he's also very good 
in that space just in front of the defense so I don't I mean I don't know if if he's been somebody who's been on your lists Lee but you know he's for me whenever I watched him it was just that he seemed like he had a great engine it seemed like he was very very disruptive and you know when you pitch him with goals naturally if you're not a striker people are going to pick up on that yeah I think it's it's interesting with uh, Belmonte because he is such a balanced player all round. It's not just the defensive aspect or the the ability to to score, whether from range or within around the the edge of the penalty area. But he's also quite good at progressing the ball. You see him quite often for Lanus. He'll be the player who looks to drop back to receive the ball from the defenders. And then if he has space, he's got a lovely, clean strike of a ball. Um, his passing range lets him access all different areas. He sometimes with right-footed players that play in that position, you see them almost unconsciously favour the ball out to the right-hand side. But I, I haven't specifically seen that from Belmonte when I've watched him. Um, instead, it, it's not uncommon to see him kind of open up his hips and hit the left side of the field. So he's got that range that he can go either way, which is important for teams to have in that position. I think you're right. I think that there's some confusion at the moment around Lanis as to, to exactly how they're using Belmonte. I mean, for a player of his age profile at the moment, you kind of start to get... It's, it's quite funny. South American players are very much like scouted football players. Once they hit 23... <laughs> European teams start to get a little bit more wary as to whether they're going to be the right player to take across to Europe, if you like, and that that's just something that it's a coachability thing. No, 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 sorry, not coachability. That's the wrong way to put it. But you're looking to be able to make an imprint on a young player in terms of adding to his tactical, tactical rather than technical and perhaps mental as well profile so you're looking to get them across early so you've got time to build that player up to what you want him but at 23 quite often in players you're kind of getting to the point where what you see is kind of what you get from South American players and by Monte at 22 you would think that he is going to start losing value at some point interestingly he's signed to quite a good agency um, who have a lot of players with South American background Sergio Aguero is with that same agency Matias Palacios uh, who of course moved to Italy, Luciana Vieto, who's played around around Europe for a long time now, are all people within that same agency. But they also have Fabricio Bustos, who's the right back, who a lot of people have been thinking we're going to, was going to make the move across to Europe, but he's now hit that 24 mark and kind of the, the interest has died down. So you have to really wonder what's going to happen with Belmonte. If he makes that move to Europe, you, you would like to think it would happen sooner rather than later. I'd 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 like to see him sort of take a, a similar path to Tagliafico or Ajax. You know, he was one yeah. of those who perhaps, you know, got to that twenty three exactly twenty four stage and, and maybe the top clubs in, in Europe's top five leagues weren't looking at him anymore, but he was still a very, very good player and quite clearly one of the standouts in, in, in Argentina. So Ajax picking him up for I don't know, what was it? Uh, something between three and six million yep. was, you know, a great, great snip. Um and I think that someone could certainly pick up a similar bargain with Belmonte because you know he he just has that dual ability as, as you were saying you know that ability to to go into the the, the left hand spaces you know having that range um, and even still at twenty two I think he's still very I know he's played a fair bit of football but he's still very young in terms of um, in, in I think in terms of his maturity um, so I think that you could definitely mould a player like him if you brought him into a team which was very structured very you know played a certain way because all he's known is, is coming through the Lanos Academy you know he's played with a lot of the players who are currently in the Lanos squad because they're all the vast majority of them are, are academy players um, who've come through so it's not as if he's he's had to be mashed together with players from here there and everywhere I think there'd be some teething problems in terms of adaptation, but I think if you put him into a, a setup where everybody was singing from the same hymn sheet, there was less focus on individuality and more on functionality, then he'd certainly be a, be a very in, in, enticing prospect for a number of clubs. That's all we have from the Scouted Football Podcast today. Myself and Lee will be back in March with another scouting episode and I will be back next week with another episode on the Scouted Pod. Uh, Remember to check out Scouted Football on YouTube for all the snippets of all our podcasts. Uh, We'll be continuing to branch out with more exciting things there. 
And remember to let us know when you're listening, how you're listening. Tag us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, whether it's on a walk, on the way to work, while you work out, or just sat at home on an evening. Uh, We'd love to hear your feedback and and what you love and hate about the Scouted Pod. Um, If you'd like yet more content from us, please do think about subscribing to our Patreon for more podcasts, exclusive website pieces, and handbook sneak peeks and previews and back issues and and the lot. That is all I have to add. Thank you very much for tuning in. I've been Joe Donahue, and you'll be hearing from me very soon. Bye for now. Thank you.